This is Hebrew Hits, presented by JTribeRadio.com. I'm your host, Malia, and I sit down with people who live by the motto, it's what you do with what you have that makes a difference. Welcome to the 40th episode of Hebrew Hits. I'm your host, Malia, and today I am so privileged to be sitting down with artist Devora. Before we get to the episode, I'd like to kindly ask you if you can please go follow Hebrew Hits on Instagram on fa- and Facebook, which is at Hebrew underscore hits. We are also available on YouTube. Please go hit that Woo-hoo. subscribe button. Yeah, please go hit that subscribe button at Hebrew Hits Radio. Follow, like, share with all your friends, and please follow us and subscribe on all your favorite streaming apps that are available on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, wherever you hear your podcasts. Well, it's time for me to introduce artist Devora. She became an Instagram sensation over the past year. And I'm going to talk to her about her background, where she came from, how she grew so quickly in the art field. Artist Devora, which is Devora Weiss, welcome to Hebrew Heads. Thank you so much for having me again. <laughs> <laughs> how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Hanukkah just ended. I saw that you were a part of some like giveaway thing. You want to talk? What, 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 what was that? Yeah, the beauty of Instagram is that you really get to meet and like interact with all these other accounts. Some of them are actually even local to me where I live. And I was reached out by another artist um, to join like this creative giveaway. And I gave away a print of one of my works. And it was just really nice. I've taken like the time recently to like not really be participating in a lot of giveaways but I couldn't resist because it was like full of a bunch of really amazing creative women so I was just like okay I have to do it I did a pre Hanukkah giveaway with Hebrew Hits where we gave out cash to our followers I feel like it's the holiday season everyone's you know giving out like giveaways and giving out prizes why not you know it's the fun thing to do yeah I actually won like two giveaways on Instagram and it's so much fun and it's so exciting so these things are really legit. Like I actually have to go print out the print I'm sending out like this week. It's part of my agenda and I'm really excited about it. That's so exciting. So Zvora, tell us about your background. How were you brought up? What's your background like? For sure. Um, so I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. It's a small town. It's definitely a lot bigger than it is today. It is a lot bigger now than what it was when I grew up there. And I grew up with traditional parents, and I actually always went to the the from school in the neighborhood, though. And I lived in the from neighborhood. I lived next to the main shul, but I grew up just a little bit different than most of my peers because of my family background. So you would call your parents, what were they, traditional, like modern? They were traditional Sparty parents. (laughs) Um, we were actually the only Sparty people in the whole community to show how small it was. Like, I think the first time I met someone who was Sparty, I was like so excited. I didn't, I thought we were like the only type of Sparty people in the universe. It was like really exciting for me. <laughs> you know that I'm a quarter Sparty. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. That's so cool. Well, now you do. But so you, you grew up not religious at all, you're saying? Um, not, not at all. I grew up just not really practicing mitzvahs like we did like some things shabbos obviously like shana and yom kippur and stuff but like we would drive to shul on shabbos and we would go out to eat not kosher sometimes but it would be like very specific not kosher we'd be like we'll eat kosher fish and salads and like there were certain like levels within what we did it wasn't just like we did everything we just we had we under we understood what the Torah said. We just didn't necessarily like practice it to the fullest. So why did you go to a Beisako school? How did that happen? So my parents are traditional, so they do believe in the Torah and the Orthodox way and stuff. They just aren't, like I said, practicing. Mm-hmm. So they weren't comfortable sending us to reform they because they felt like reform was just a totally different branch that they weren't like really a part of and they didn't like that and being that both of my parents were from different countries my mother's from Mexico and my father's Israeli they both grew up 
where marrying a Jew was like the most important thing you could do. And they saw that in their form communities, like everyone was like intermarried. It's just a little bit really messy for them. So they wanted to send us to like the most Yeshar place there was. And being that it was such a small town, there wasn't like, it's really just like black or white. There was nothing in between. So we ended up at the Orthodox school, which was really amazing because that's how I am where, where I am today. And it's also just, if I was in a bigger city, like, I don't know if I've ever would have really started becoming from her and taking on more mitzvos because there would have been probably more of a place for me in society. But mm-hmm. being that I grew up in such a small town, it was either like you're really from or you're not. So we were part of the really from group, but we weren't. So we ended up slowly growing up that. That's so interesting. Was it hard for you to be in a classroom setting with a bunch of girls that were totally Shomer Shabbos, were completely Beis Yaakov? And then there's you that, that you know, you're more traditional. Do they feel that there was a difference you know, did, or did you feel like there's a difference between you and the other girls? Yeah, for sure. I don't know if for a while they even realized what was different. Like they knew we were different, maybe just because we're like tan or something, but like <laughs> they didn't even know why we were really different. I mean, I'm sure now they do, but um, no, they never like excluded me or anything, but I always felt like more of an outcast. Like I couldn't really like blend myself in perfectly because... I came from such a different background and like my family was just doing different things and that was okay in my house and it wasn't okay in theirs. So it took me a while to like really understand that for like, for, I think until like probably like eighth grade, I was just, I just felt like I was just different. until I realized how to really embrace it. Wow. So did you feel comfortable having your friends over at your house? Yeah, my parents lived in the main community. They lived right next to the main school in Cincinnati. So they were like a part of things and they did their best to keep ceramics those at home. So I wasn't like embarrassed. It wasn't like anything bad was happening in my home. It was just, we weren't necessarily the most from. Right. I hear. Wow. It's so interesting. It's amazing to see how you are today. You're living in, you know, New York. Where are we <laughs> I, from? I would, I would never, when you first told me your story, I was like, what Devorah, what? I would never think that because you fit in so well. Like you, do you feel like you had to learn the lingo? You knew the lingo because that's the schools that you were a part of? Or out of town, there's no lingo? um, There was, but I remember the first time someone asked me if I was from, I think I was seven. And they're like, this girl was like, are you from? And I was like, yeah, I'm from Detroit. Because my family just moved from Detroit. And I remember my sister and I were just like, (laughs) we had no idea what she was saying. She's like, are you from? And we're like, yeah, we just moved here. We're from Detroit. Like, what else do you want to know about us? So it definitely took some time, like, adapting and learning. And um, thankfully, everyone, in, like, I grew up with were really nice. And, like, they, like, I hung out at a lot of my friends' house a lot, like, especially on Shabbos. Like, mm-hmm. And I, I saw what they were doing. And it was really all I knew. It just was I wasn't necessarily holding where they were holding yet. What would you say was your biggest challenge growing up, being that you were in a base Yaakov and your parents were more traditional and everything was more traditional at home? Um, I think it was not really appreciating my parents as much as I should have growing up as I do today, because then when I was in high school, it became like the cool, like find yourself and your Judaism. Like everyone had this like whole like wake up call and like seminary and like I was just like oh I did that like seven years ago like I was the yeah. program people. so I think it was just that like I used to be really like embarrassed and like ashamed of them like in some ways because I'd be like walking around and I would see my like my mom drive and I'd be like oh my gosh don't like we don't know each other but honestly oh, yeah. at the end of the day um I learned to appreciate it because I understand diversity and I let them do what they do they let me do what I do and I think that's the most important and I also feel like very thankful that I had this opportunity to like explore my from Kite and my Yiddish Kite in a way that was really unique to me like I know a lot of people who are from from birth um they struggled when they became teenagers like wanting to re-accept it all upon themselves like they just felt like they were part of this like box, I guess, and they just slept there long. So I was part of that box, but like I wasn't 
part of the box at the same time. Like I was with them during their, when they were going through that, but I already went through a lot of that because I, I chose to do certain things. Like when I was like a certain age, I decided I wasn't going to drive to Seoul if my parents went to Chavez because my parents like to go to like a farther Seoul and I was just going to go to the one down the street. And like, I chose to do different things wow. and being able to choose that, I think like having that choice really made me appreciate it so much more. How old were you when you decided that? I think I was like 13 or so. Um, I decided I was not going to eat out with my family, which was really hard because we like to eat out and there was no kosher restaurant. I think there was one kosher restaurant, which was like, you know, out of town pizza. (laughs) Like you get it like three hours later and it's like cold and. Oh my God. um, So it was definitely really hard. And then it kind of slowly went from there with making like, I tried at first to like start with halakha and then eventually like branch out to hashtag type of thing. So you're saying that you were 13. Now I want to hear your story. Like how did you decide to, okay, say I'm going to become frummer than my family. Tell me a little bit about your siblings. How many siblings do you have? Where do you fall out in the family? Like maybe did an, if you had an older sibling, I'm not even sure. Did they take mm-hmm. this on earlier? You followed in their way or did your siblings follow yeah. you? So I had um, an old, I have an older sister and a younger brother, so I'm in the middle. And um, a lot had to do also with my older sister and also with like myself. Like I, like I said, we really lived like on the most popular block in Cincinnati. It was like right next to the shoal. And if you walk around the bend, you're right at like the main schools. So we lived really within the community. And I was, I was getting a little bit older. I was just starting to get really embarrassed. Like, I remember we, like, would, like I said, we would drive to, like, the Chabad that was, like, 30 minutes from my house, and I would, like, stuck in the car so no one would see me because I would feel so embarrassed. Like, I didn't want people in the community seeing that, and I think that also, that really, like, drove me. I'm like, okay, if I'm feeling embarrassed to do that, like, then I should really just, like, stop. And it was hard because it was something I did with my parents every week. And it was like definitely a family bonding thing to go to that show. And that show had a lot of different type of from people. So it was definitely um, a little bit more welcoming for us. But um, so when I started feeling that, and also I had, I have like an older sister and she was getting into high school. And I think she also started feeling that like a little bit of embarrassment. And she wanted to change and grow. And I guess, she realized like she's really until a certain point you're really like a kid but then she's like okay I'm growing up I'm in high school like I like I really could start making my own like decisions especially if I want to go to seminary like I have to be who I want to be in a few years and I have to start working on myself now and seeing her do that really led me to also like want to um, grow in my own way. So you became about Shuba you do you call yourself or you just call yourself that you became more from at like 13 I'm assuming that was the age so I wouldn't call myself necessarily a Baal because I never felt like I wasn't a part of Judaism Judaism was really such a part of my like my grandparents um, were immigrants from Iraq and then they eventually made their way to the U.S. and they were just so proud to be Jewish like I almost feel embarrassed to say that because now I'm like a practicing from Jew but like certain sense of proudness my grandparents and parents have about being Jewish it's something I work on all the time because they're just so proud of their Jewish identity so it's never like I like I was hiding from being Jewish it was just not necessarily knowing the whole realm of what it is to be Jewish and there was more and being that my parents are also both very spiritual like my mom was very connected to Hashem Hashem was always a part of my life it was just like I said it was more learning and just understanding more and deciding to take more things upon myself so I never really like felt like I wasn't a part of it and I found it It was more like I was there and it was just kind of like opening my eyes slowly more and more to what it was your story is incredible how you were so young and you became so much more religious than your family how are your parents now are they also more religious are they still traditional like how are they where are they holding my parents are still traditional like I said it was definitely hard for them because a lot of these things we did we weren't necessarily like going against halakha 
completely. Like we would go out to eat and we had like our levels of what we would eat. And it was very hard for them, especially being that we were in such a small town that we like stopped doing that because that was what how they bonded with us. They took us out to eat the fancy restaurants or they took us to the stool on Shabbos. That was like really part of my childhood. So that was really hard for them. And like just us slowly, I guess, branching away from them a little bit. But I think they realized that we never really left them. We call them daily. Like Aww. they're still very much a part of our lives. So they never got like pushed out of the picture. But I think they had that fear for a little bit because we were doing something different from them. Right. But um, Baruch Hashem, we have a good relationship with my parents. They are still the same way they always are. And I learned to just really accept them, which was something I really struggled with when I was younger. And I learned to accept them. And there's so much I appreciate about how they raised me because I saw how so many of my friends really struggled with feeling like they were forced to be a certain way and they're forced to be from. And I never had that because I never felt forced in any way. I always felt like I was able to not, or I, I was able to, and it both were fine. And it just felt like just much better, I feel like. Do your parents 100% accept you and your sister? To this day, I'm saying um, right now? Yeah, I, I I think they do. I mean, sometimes they do get a little bit frustrated with us because like, especially the summer shop is be really long and they get a little bit nervous, but they're definitely very respectful. Like they won't do, like, I know they do certain things, but they won't do it in front of my sister and I think like Shabbos, they'll wow. go to their room to be on their phones and not do it in the living room in front of like us or our children. So um, we definitely learned to find an even ground. Wow. I'm so, so impressed because you're how old right now? 23, 24? Yeah, 23. You're 23. You became much more religious than your family when you were only 13 years old right yeah if you did that you could do anything you're a 13 year old you're already a boss woman at age 13 oh thank you yeah um it definitely was a journey like I never really like like I said I never really viewed myself about being outside the front community because I always lived within it right so but it was definitely like an adjustment and definitely I felt like it made me a little bit more mature than my peers in the time. And it was hard to relate, but now in the long run, I wouldn't have changed my upbringing for anything in the world. Right. I, I do want to ask you this question because my family, I have family from Cincinnati and I know it's a very small community. How were you're talking about your friends and your peers? How many peers did you actually have? Like how many students was actually in a class? So I think that, I had the biggest class. I had five girls in my whole grade. The whole grade, five. not just class. <laughs> um, and so you had more than one class. You had more than one class, no, even though it was only five no, kids. Uh, no, no, it was one grade. And that was the whole class, the five girls. Um, and I'm still really close with a lot of them today. Wow. And it um, happens to be like at one point, like the community went through like a lot of changes and they had opened a new school and it was, really scary for me because my parents were like if they don't open a new school you're going to public school and I remember just like really davening that they would have something because I really did want to go to public school and they thankfully they opened something and there was only nine of us in the whole school there wasn't even a 12th grade I remember we got once in so much trouble because we lied to the teacher that there really was a 10th girl just she never shows up <laughs> And I think she believed us for like three months until like one day, like my principal was like, there's no 10th girl. It's just nine of them, <laughs> the whole school. So wow. it was definitely like very different than I guess your typical base Yakov experience. <laughs> wow. So when you're saying about like people accepting your friends coming over, we're not talking about that many people. We're talking about a very, no. very, very, that's Yeah, nice. we're definitely a very small community. Like I said, it's definitely yeah. gross. I think the high school now has... 40 plus girls, which is huge because like I said, we were nine girls in the whole school. Right. And yeah, it definitely, but we, I, these people I grew with, I really, I saw them every day. They're people who are really part of my life. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ever really knew my full story, but it was just, it's interesting how we really like lived so much together because mm -hmm. we were all each other hat. Well, now they're going to know your whole story. Oh yeah, now they all. Hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi people in Cincinnati. 
before we even talk about your art, I do want to ask you this. How, the, the entire mantra of Hebrew Hits is, it's what you do with what you have that makes a difference. How would you say your life applies to this mantra? Um, so I think something I struggled a lot in, with my teen years was trying to find my place because I really wanted to, like, I always wish, like, all the girls in my grade, I think all their fathers were rabbis. My father was the only mister in the whole town. Like, oh it was very <laughs> different. And I remember just being, like, so, like, craving this, like, certain, like, childhood and upbringing that wasn't mine. And then I think really it relates to the mantra in the way that I had to really learn how to accept what I had to be who I am today. And I really think it made me, like, it made me more mature when I was younger. Um, and it just made me have, like, a better experience. Like, I feel like in my older years, like, I felt like, and like I said, a lot of my friends struggled, especially, like, in seminary and everything. And I just felt very secure in my relationship with Hashem. And I think, and that carries with me to today. And I think being able to do with what I had really changed my experience in life today. So it was huge. Wow. So you're saying acceptance, accepting who you are and really knowing yourself. That's how yeah. that's what you, you learned. Yeah. Accepting myself and those around me and like really like getting to know myself because I think that's something we all do. And if you look at the 2021 vision boards, everyone's like, get to know myself better. And I really yeah. feel like I like had that advantage. I really got to explore who I am and, and at such see, a young age, at a young age. And yeah. it really has carried me forward. And it, I really think it got me to where I am today. Like I got offered many amazing positions after like I was in Israel, I was working at the local high school here in Parathway and I think I was the only young pe person there under like literally 30. I was 19 working at the wow. high school. And like, I was also working at a seminary and I feel like just me being secure with who I am made me open to all these positions and opportunities because people were attracted to that. They wanted someone who wasn't wishy-washy and seemed like, I mean, obviously I was, I'm still a person. I not always, my act isn't always together. <laughs> but I think they knew that I was consistent and I'll, I'll do what I say. And that made such a big difference. Devorah, you're an amazing human being. Your story is incredible. And now that we all know that part of you, let's hear about your art. So Devorah, please share with us what you do. For all the people listening who do not know what you do, please tell us. Sure. Um, so yeah, like you said, that was my upbringing. It was a little bit different than your average person. Um, and right now I am a partial, I guess, stay at home mom. I just recently started sending my daughter to play group. I sometimes attend myself. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, the things we do for our children. Um, so, um, so I did that and that really propelled me to explore what I am today in the art field. And I am a super calligrapher and I do other forms of art, which I sell on. So cool. So please tell us what is going on behind you. I love that your art studio behind you, that like oh, stuff that's you. going so, on. So what's going this on? Is my, this is my art studio. Um, I actually only recently, within like the last year, got it together. Um, up here, I have all my calligraphy inks. And these are just like what I call my junk paintbrushes because I have like a few of my favorite ones. And then here it was this past month, I had a commission with someone. So I wrote down the words with like some I guess math with it over here so I was able to do it on my final copy I have a palette for painting over here and I like whenever I buy watercolors to like swatch them out so I could have them as a reference for just to see that. the color because sometimes you see something in a bottle it's not always that color when you paint it so I like to have the references over here I love that and that desk whoa that's an incredible art desk tell me about the desk Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's really cool, actually. Um, it, the whole thing lights up, and it actually tops up and lowers, so really, like, multi-purpose, and the reason why I like having a desk that lights up is that I do a lot of calligraphy, and something I hate is, like, eraser marks on my paper, so I usually make myself, like, a template, and then I use my light box desk to copy it over, like, cleanly, mm -hmm. no lines. 
And how did you get that desk? I know how you got that desk, but share with the oh. audience that you got it. <laughs> so I kindly hinted to my spouse for many months in advance that I really liked this desk. And I think he realized how serious I was taking my art and he kindly surprised me with it on my birthday this past year. But um, really for anyone who's listening, you really don't need much to create. I was creating on my dining room table and my kitchen table for years in my life. So having this little nook in my house was really special to me and it meant a lot. But you really don't need fancy supplies or anything if you have a passion for it yeah for sure so who inspired you to go into art um so my grandfather Alava Shalom was an oil painter um and I just always grew up watching him paint and he would take me to the art shop and I loved it um and I always knew I was like creative but I didn't know exactly how I wanted to channel it and I remember trying for a lot of years to just paint and I don't like I, I definitely have painted oil paintings and acrylic paintings before, but it wasn't something I loved. Like I did it and I felt like myself like pushing myself through. It wasn't something I felt like I could get like lost into it. So and then for a while I like decided when I was like 14, 15, I was gonna be like a bridal dress designer. And I actually went on like a whole like I even took like special like sketch classes because I decided I was gonna go to SIT here in New York. Mm-hmm. And I really, I mean, I still love those sketches and I love doing that. It was definitely a lot of fun, but I took this calligraphy class, like a Hebrew calligraphy class when I was in high school. And it just felt like I finally clicked. Like, I'm like, this is what my passion is. Like, it, sometimes it does just look like words, but the beauty of like Judaism and Hebrew is that every word is so rich, so much meaning behind it. So I just felt like, it connected to like my purpose in life, I guess, like being a Jew. And I was able to take something that I had with like a talent and be able to combine the two and create something. That's incredible. So your background really does have an impact on what you are creating. Because if you didn't take that leap and say, okay, I'm going to become from her, you wouldn't have necessarily gone into calligraphy, Hebrew calligraphy art. Right. I don't know if I would have appreciated it because a lot of times, like I said, it just looks like words. Mm-hmm. But if you realize the meaning behind the words and like there's so much like behind the scenes of calligraphy and, and the lining, the placing, it's just like it's definitely like I felt like I just found like my calling almost like it just it felt right. So I know that you said you were teaching in a school and you were in seminary and things like that. Why didn't you go into becoming an artist right away? You came home from STEM. Why not do it full time? So I came home. I actually went to two years and I finished a bachelor's in my second year. And I decided I was going to be a businesswoman and go into human resources. And I was going to make lots of money and rake in the dough. <laughs> and that was my plan. And I was in the after school until I was nine months pregnant. I think the month, like literally two weeks before I gave birth, I graduated and then I had a baby and I never looked at my degree again, um, not on purpose, but yeah, but I was definitely encouraged by my, my family. And like, I just, I had this mentality, like, I just want to get school over. If I get school over, I could finally, I don't know, I just wanted to get out of the way. But what I didn't realize was on one hand, that is a great way to view it. And if there's anyone who's young listening and they had this mentality that they just want to get through school, that's great. But there is a certain beauty of experience and trying different things out and like figuring out what you like, because I didn't realize that. And I now I know working in human resources, I would probably be miserable. I worked in offices for two years and I hated it every day. So it's like on one hand, like I said, it's disappointing, but we live and we learn. And um, I don't regret the experience I had from all the things I learned, but I definitely would say like, if I could go back in time, I wish I, instead of rushing into a master's, I would have taken the time to intern maybe at different places just to figure out exactly what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. People ask me all the time, like even in radio, how did you get into it? How do you, how do you do a bunch of different things? I said, in order to find out what you love, you got to try so many things. You know what I'm saying? So So don't regret, like, don't regret that you did that. You thought you wanted to, now you're doing this and you're becoming successful. 
Exactly. It's just you know? about channeling all you have and what you do at that time. Exactly. And then, so I ended up actually, so I, so I got this master's that I was just felt like it was the right thing because that's what all those people in my circle around me were telling me to do. Yeah. And not my husband, where he wasn't oh. in the picture yet. When I already, I, I think I started dating once I was like in my second semester with him. So I wasn't really, oh, well. he had nothing to do. I think he would have been like, don't do it. But he's very like into this new age. College isn't as important as it used to be mentality, but mm -hmm. as part of the old age society. Mm -hmm. um, but then I had a baby and she was colicky and really, really, really fussy. And I was really not sleeping for at least the first four months of her life, like at all, like she would be up like five, six, seven times a night. So like, I remember if she was like seven weeks old and my boss called me, he's like, are you coming back to work? And I was like, no, nope. <laughs> like I, it just, I, I, it was like, and it was two o'clock and I was still in bed and I was like, I can't come back. I was like, really, it was such a beautiful time in my life. But it was also one of the most challenging times of my life because I was so exhausted and she was so, so fussy. And like, there was really nothing you could do about it other than to let them grow out of it. So we decided it would be best for me to be home for the time. And I was home and then like, I, things got better. She started sleeping, Baruch Hashem. And <laughs> I realized that like, I wanted to do something a little bit more and like, feel like, like a little bit, like, I guess more entertained and busy. Like there's only so much like scrolling on the internet you could do with your brain like so mm -hmm. at first I was like maybe I might decide to sell hats and hair accessories because I had this like love for hair accessories and I sold some and I did it and I even made myself an Etsy shop and it was like cute and stuff but I realized that I didn't really enjoy that at like it was something I always dreamt about but it wasn't something I actually enjoyed in practice like I knew how to like I knew how to sew because I took sewing classes at one point in my life to learn how to make gowns and stuff. But I also started taking seamstress jobs just to make a little side income for our, my family. And I also started hating sewing. Like I would not look at the sewing machine when I didn't have a job. I was like, this. I realized like certain things, like they're meant to be hobbies. And once you start putting price tags on it, it just becomes really unenjoyable. And it, all the fun you had in it is gone. Like, like that so um so then I decided okay fine I'm not gonna do that and actually Hanukkah last year marked I think the one year of my first actual sale on Instagram for artwork wow. because um I decided to paint some paintings for my home I was like you know what like, I'm creative my house needs some art because all my walls were literally empty and I was like so I just decided to paint this like abstract wholesale with like like rhinestones on it it was very abstract and I remember I just made myself an art account and I called myself art and calligraphy by Devora and it was a very long name and it was a very ugly page and my pictures were awful but I decided to just like <laughs> post my art no it was fine because I was just posting it was just a hobby I was just posting for fun there was no like nothing to it it was just whenever I felt like it mm -hmm. I would post and I remember I posted this cosal and like one person I didn't know called me and another person I had no idea who they were on the internet just found my page and they're like, oh, this is exactly why I want my house. I want to buy that off of you right now. And then I was like, hey, like I enjoy painting and I enjoy making the money off of it. Like, let's try that again. And I, since then, I just started working on making my page much more nicer and like easier to be on and kind of also mm -hmm. like, then I was painting and I decided to kind of narrow it down to basically just take paper calligraphy. Sometimes they do something called mycography, which is where you make an image out of lots of lots of words. And like, I just really yeah. kind of like narrowing it down to those few things with like, and I use like watercolors and some stuff sometimes, but um, I don't offer as much as I used to because I found that easier for people when they come to my page and they see oh that's the boy she does calligraphy she does some watercolors great right that's that right because it's it's more of a niche like it's not like a range that people are like oh my gosh what can I order it's a niche and they know exactly what they what they can get from yeah them. yeah and so that's really how I got there because 
I really have to think it's my daughter because I wouldn't, it would have always just been a hobby. Like I knew how to do it in high school and I wouldn't have ever really thought of selling. Like I think the first, I like make these spirals and the first spiral I sold was like $30. And I definitely wow. have upped my prices since then and, <laughs> and recognize my value. And it's funny because when I was selling them for $30, I didn't get that many sales. Like you'd be surprised. But now that I've really, now that I really value myself and people see that they're more willing to pay the price that it really is valued at. Wow. Which is? I'm, well, we're still working on it, but at the moment it's at a hundred for a custom spiral. Yeah, for sure. I like the amount of time it takes you and how, how beautiful it is. It's, it's incredible. It's amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So it's just, you, yeah. Do you feel that you, do you feel that your outlook on life has changed since you decided I'm doing, I'm becoming an artist full time? Yeah, it definitely has. Um, like I said, I've been, my number one job here has always been to be my daughter's mother because that's right. what we decided it was to stay at home mom and then the art comes second. Um, recently, like I said, with the whole, I'm sorry, going to play group again to help her get adjusted. <laughs> um, amazing. It, um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just trying to um, take also the time now to really like focus on exp expanding and building and uh -huh. Thankfully, I have made really multiple, multiple sales on Instagram via DM, but I would like to make myself have a more official platform. I've been saying this probably for like seven months now, but I haven't really had the time. And now that she's out of my house in the morning, I'm really just sitting down and focusing. Like I'm sitting here making a website or I'm working on art or going to printers. I'm really exploring what else I can do. Like I know what I could do, but now I'm like, what else can I do to make it larger on a bigger scale? Right. And I want to ask you this question. How did you grow so fast, so quickly on Instagram? I know that you started a little bit over a year ago. I think Sukis was probably a year since you opened your page, right? A year. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So it's like 18 months, let's say around that mm -hmm. you started your page and you grew so fast. Your stuff is incredible, but how did you do it? People want to know how how um it's definitely a lot of work but um I always say every follower counts I remember suck it. um I made my page for a hobby and I remember I reached 100 followers I was like so excited I was like I like came home I was like oh my gosh like my husband like 100 random I mean it wasn't completely random I would say like 70 of them actually knew me and 30 of them okay. didn't I'm like a hundred people like follow me. Like imagine a hundred people in a room and they're all watching me. Like that's so exciting. I was yeah. so excited. Sadly, I lost a little bit of that excitement along the way trying to reach certain like goals and followers. But then I realized obviously it's not about the number. It's about mm -hmm. just how much they care about what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And it was just really trying to just trial and error, po posting things and seeing does this, do people like that? Do people like this? Do people like when I share more about my personal life? Do people um, like, it was really just, like I said, it's a lot of like figuring out what my audience liked and expected of me. Right. And like for, like I said, in the beginning, I offered this very wide range of whatever I was doing. Like, I think it was just like today a car in any form and any medium. Mm -hmm. Now I have really tried to like narrow it down, like Hebrew calligraphy, watercolors, and that's it. And I think now that people know who I am and they know what to expect of me, it just, it also made it easier and just taking the, the social media, social media, um, yeah. to the next level. Like I met so many great accounts, including your own on social media mm -hmm. and just re like a lot of times, sometimes they reach out to me, like want to participate in a giveaway and like work mm -hmm. with some other accounts and stuff. I've definitely participated in a few of those and I've always benefited one way or another. And I, I know some people feel like very turned off by the whole giveaway thing. They think it's like a scam or whatever. And as a small business owner, I've definitely seen the benefit in participating in mm -hmm. the sense that I've made sales off them. People have recommended me to other people to come host an art party by them. So I definitely recommend those for someone starting off because it's like, it's like a instant word of mouth. Like, you know, right. you see something from a friend's page and you're like, Oh, like 
I want to try that. They, they just said, that's amazing. And then like, right. So when you're part of a giveaway with all these other accounts and you're like, Oh, like I never heard of that. Like, that's actually interesting. I might look at that. Yeah. But I know when I was talking to you earlier, you said that you also did a lot of research, like with hashtags and I don't know, you like check the, the insights right. yeah. on your Instagram. Oh, yeah. So, so talk about that. Cause that's, if people don't want to spend money on giveaways, maybe the hashtags and how you built up that way through your research can help people. Right. Well, also there's different types of giveaways. You could offer something you do. Like, I mean, obviously everything has values, but it doesn't right. always have to be paid. And like my first giveaway was one I just ran by myself. And I think it was actually one of my most successful giveaways for my page. I, it really, like that giveaway, it was what pivoted on my page. And you could, people could scroll back and they'll see that first giveaway. And that was what really made my page evolve. So wow. every account can know that. And there's also, um, yeah, there's insight. In Instagram is a tool and you definitely need to learn how to use it. There's ways on the app to learn more about your geographics. Like I know that the majority of my followers actually live in New York and they're mostly women. So I try to cater to them and try to be relatable. I try to also keep certain like privacy things. Like I'm not really showing my daughter's face on my Instagram. I very much believe my page is art and it's strictly art related. So you might see me share something I think is beautiful, but you won't really be seeing so much behind the scene of my life. Right. Because I just don't think that, I just don't think that has value. Some people could be hairstylists and they could be sharing their life and some people love that. But for me, I just don't think that really adds to my page. And I think every content creator and business owner or whatever you are on social media has to figure out like, what can I do to enhance my page and grow it? Not just because mm -hmm. everyone else is doing it. And yeah, but when you did post, when you did post about your daughter, that was so cute. She was like, you're like little artist. Yeah, I saw on your page, like, I don't know, maybe a month ago, you're like little yeah. artist in here. That was so adorable. It was so relatable because everybody either has a niece or a daughter or a grandkid. Whoever's watching, like has somebody that they know that's a child. And that was right. so little and cute. She was like, yeah, she had like the paintbrush. So cute. Like with yourself, yeah, right? Sometimes she joins me when I like am finishing something up. Yeah. So um, cute. but I, I don't necessarily show her face. I think people know I'm a mom because I talk right. about my motherhood because I really do connect my art journey with my motherhood journey, but I really don't really show like my husband either on my page. Right. I just think that it's in our page. I will talk about my life because they are factors in my life, but they're not necessarily gonna be like front screen most of the time. And I also, there's hashtags. There's just so many different ways that you could find out on Google about how you could use Instagram to like help you excel and grow. And I mean, I think hashtags now are becoming outdated as they keep on changing the app. So you definitely have to be on top of things, but now there's reels. And when last time we spoke, I don't think there was reels. Right. And I found that reels for some reason do really well. So you have to figure out where to put your energy and what, what to invest in so you could like mm -hmm. keep on growing. Right, for sure. And I, I know that you were telling me you're going to help me with reels. You're still going to help me with that? Of <laughs> course. Yeah, we're going to make some fun dancing reels. I'm kidding. <laughs> Yay. Exciting. Well, when I post the Hebrew Hits rail, reel, I'll have you in it. Maybe we should do a reel together. You want to do a reel together? Yeah, for sure. It'd be so much fun. Okay. Reels are a lot of fun. And like I said, for some reason, Instagram is really pushing them right now. And mm -hmm. I've seen that they, that they just do really well. Okay. So Sunday, we're going to do a reel at my house and we'll do like artists and we'll do, and we'll promote the episode that way. You'll post it to your page. I'll awesome. Here. Yeah. Awesome. You're on. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Awesome. So, Devar, before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to share? Yeah. I think, like I said before, if there's one message I could like leave the audience with is that you really don't have to have fancy things to create. You could just create with what you have. Literally, like back in the olden days, people would paint on walls of caves with like certain sticks. So if you have a desire to do something, you, you'll find a way to do it, even if it's like not fancy supplies. Mm -hmm. And also to just explore, explore who they are, what they like, and keep on trying. I know it's like the most cliche thing to like keep on trying, but like it's like, even the Torah, Sheva Yipal Sadik, you have to keep on like, and become, you don't want to forget the get up part. <laughs> you have to get up, but um, you yeah. have to, it's really about, it's life. You have to like 
fall a few times and you have to get up and try again. Like, I honestly don't think I would be where I am today in my page from making sales if it wasn't for the fact that a year ago, I tried to, I, more than, it's been three years, I, I tried to work in offices and I realized I was really miserable at a nine to five. And then I realized that I didn't enjoy doing a hobby of mine, which is sewing. I still sew at home for myself and my, like, mm -hmm. I repair my husband's clothing all the time, but um, not as all the time as he likes, but I do repair his clothing here and there. <laughs> And yeah. I don't mind doing it because I'm doing it for my family and I'm doing it as a hobby. But like, it's something that every person, if they're looking to start out and branch out, is is this a hobby or is this something I really want to try? It? Right. Sometimes the sometimes the line gets blurry. Like I've taken some breaks from Instagram, even a lot like within the last month, just because I started feeling that pressure. And once that pressure comes on, I'm like you know what, I'm going to take a step back. I'm not going to post as much. I'm going to just like, you know what, I'm just going to have fun because once I'm starting to lose focus on the fun aspect of why I'm doing what I love, mm -hmm. then I try to reevaluate and see what's weighing me down. Some, a lot of the time, the social media aspect weighs me down because I get very stressed out about like, is this the right time to post? Is this and all the analytic aspects? And I realized that when you step back and you take a break and then you realize what you're in it for, you're like, okay, I could actually go back now. And if that, if you're able to go back, that means it's yeah. a keeper because sometimes you step back and you're like, I cannot go back to doing that again. So before we go, I have to ask you this. What are you doing for New Year's? This is the last episode of Hebrew Hits in 2020. You literally oh made gosh. it in. Yep. Yay. The next <laughs> next week's episode is going to be 2021. So what are you wow. doing to celebrate? the end of 2020? Um, honestly, not much. Uh, <laughs> I think it's Thursday night, but I definitely think everyone who leaves this year can give themselves a big pat on the back. I know it has affected everyone in different ways. And even if it affected you in the smallest of ways, it affects you. And just know that there's always a new day tomorrow. And I'm excited about that. I think for me, yeah. I did a lot of my New Year's resolutions on Rosh Hashanah. So it's definitely a time to like look back at them and like check them out again and be like, am I actually falling through and keep to it? Yeah. Every day is like a new year. Literally. Well, you just listened to the 40th episode of Hebrew Hits. I'm your host, Malia. And that was artist Devora. Devora, if people want to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? They can find me on Instagram at artist Devora, and very soon there'll be an artist .com, So they can find me there. Well, that is so exciting. Well, please go follow Hebrew Hits on all your favorite streaming apps and please go subscribe to Hebrew Hits Radio on YouTube. Yep, hit that subscribe button, like and share with all your friends. Please go follow Hebrew underscore hits on Instagram and on Facebook. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Have a great day.